Joseph Kahn is the deputy foreign editor of the New York Times. Prior to that, he served as the New York Times Beijing bureau chief, having previously been assigned to Shanghai. He was also a reporter in the Washington Bureau covering international economics and trade, and he was a reporter on the business desk in New York writing about Wall Street. Before joining the New York Times in January 2000, or 1998, excuse me, uh, Mr. Kahn spent four years as a China correspondent for the Wall Street Journal. He also worked as a city desk reporter and foreign correspondent for the Dallas Morning News, where he was part of a team of reporters awarded the Pulitzer Prize in 1994 for international reporting for their stories on violence against women around the world. In 2006, he and his Beijing-based colleague Jim Yardley won the Pulitzer Prize for international reporting for their ambitious stories on ragged justice in China as the booming nation's legal system evolves. He also won the Harry Chapin Media Award in the newspaper category for a series of stories on the rising wealth gap and outbreaks of mass protests in China the year before. 2004, he won the Robert F. Kennedy Journalism Award for international reporting for a series of stories on labor conditions in Chinese export factories. The same series received a citation from the Overseas Press Club. Khan received a BA in American History from Harvard College and an MA in East Asian Studies from the Harvard Graduate School in Arts and Sciences. This lecture is sponsored by the New York Times Educational Partnership. Uh, I believe uh, uh, Mr. Khan is going to be able to take advantage of our, our, our cool season still and, and get some skiing in before he leaves. Uh, but uh, please join with me in welcoming Mr. Joseph Khan. Well, thank you, Corey, for that introduction, and uh, also for having me here as part of the readership program with, with the Times. Uh, it's an important program that back in New York we're all concerned about getting the paper out, especially to a new generation of readers, we hope. Um, and, uh, you know, actually these days the American media is sort of pretty regularly accused of having too much bad news, uh, discouraging people in this economic downturn. And, you know, frankly, quite recently, most of the old line media is kind of part of the bad news because our finances aren't in such great shape. So often what my bosses now say to me, you know, because we're supervising the international news at the paper, they kind of want us to produce more upbeat stories about what's happening in other parts of the world because all the news in the United States is kind of about depression or recession or falling sales and that kind of thing. And unfortunately, the truth is, the world is also not full of good news at this point. We have a new president in office who comes in at a time of uh, pretty substantial turmoil around the world. And uh, the, tr t the truth is to try to cover that accurately, we have to reflect some of the challenges that Obama faces at the moment. And uh, I'll give you just a sampling of the kinds of things that we have to think about every day on the foreign desk of the Times, and then I want to talk about one challenge in particular. Um, but as you all know, at the moment, this country is simultaneously engaged in two separate wars. We have an ongoing war in Iraq that in the last 18 months or so is going a lot better than it did in the first five years, but uh, still involves 140,000 U.S. troops on the ground in Iraq. Um, the second war in Afghanistan is going a lot less well than it did in the early stages. and is going to require in the short term at least another 17,000 American troops. And the President announced today that he's also sending about 4,000 advisors to help with drug interdiction in Afghanistan. Neighboring Pakistan is even more of a mess in some ways. Uh, it's ceding some of its territory to a insurgency led by the Taliban. Its government is weak. And it's probably the most unstable nuclear power in the world. Not far away from there is Iran. And despite a recent effort by Obama to open up a new conciliatory diplomatic channel to Iran, there's no immediate sign that there's going to be a breakthrough in relations. 
with that country and not much indication that they're going to back away from developing nuclear weapons there without substantially more international pressure. Israel just elected a new government. Arguably, it's their most right-wing government in history. Uh, the new Prime Minister Netanyahu says that he's going to continue peace talks with the Palestinians, but he has also repeatedly disavowed the two-state solution to the Palestinian problem that has been the core framework for negotiations there for about 15, 20 years now. So that's a big uncertainty. Not so far away from here, south of the border, Mexico seems to be moving in the wrong direction. The drug war there has claimed just over 7,000 lives in the last 14 months. The economy has caught the disease that our economy has and is in a major slump, and some people worry that the Mexican government is no longer in control of all of its territory. So those are a few of the things that are on our agenda and a few of the things that probably keep President Obama awake at night. But one of the things that uh, I'm most interested in at the moment, and maybe you will be too, is something that, depending on your perspective, might be considered a relative bright spot around the world. And that is what's happening in China. There's a debate going on within China itself and among uh, scholars who pay the most attention to what's going on in China outside the country as to how this international economic crisis is affecting China. Uh, and there are a lot of uncertainties about how it will end up affecting China. But I think there's an emerging consensus among many of the people that I talk to, including our correspondents there, that this uh, global slump may have the effect of accelerating China's emergence as a peer of the United States, potentially in the medium term as a new global superpower. Um, I'll tell you in a minute why I think that, or what I think some of the indicators are of that trend. But let me first just talk about a little bit of the historical background. Um, as readers of the free New York Times that's in the racks out there every day, you are unavoidably inundated with analogies these days to the Great Depression in the 1930s. A lot of economists have warned that we face the steepest downturn in economic activity since that time. But for a lot of people who are most interested in international relations, the Great Depression doesn't really seem like the right analogy. The reason for that is that, as you know, the Great Depression ended really with the beginning of World War II, and World War II was the beginning of a half-century period of unparalleled American influence in the world. It set the stage for military dominance, economic triumph, political, unmatched political influence around the world, despite the fact that it took almost 45 years for the Cold War to end. It looked like a one-way trajectory for American power. This crisis doesn't feel like it marks the beginning of a new era of American power for a variety of reasons that I think you're largely familiar with. And I think people uh, have been searching for another historical analogy that might explain some of the international elements of the crisis that we're in now. And one of them is to go back another 60 years or so to the 1870s and to think a little bit about the economic crisis that occurred at that time, particularly beginning in 1873. As you may know from your history lessons, uh, the 1873 crisis began in Europe. Particularly, it began in the Hungarian, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, in the German states that were unified by Prussia, uh, and in France, and it was a problem not terribly unlike the one that we had now. There were the invention of new credit products, mortgages, 
There was a major housing boom, both a private one and a government financed one. Most of you have probably been to Europe at some time or another and you've probably seen some of those landmark magisterial properties in uh, Paris or Berlin or Vienna. Most of those were built during the, this period, the 1860s and the 1870s and what they call the founder period. But the fundamentals of the European economy at that time were rather weak. One of the reasons that they were weak is they were being undercut in terms of the prices, both for agricultural goods and manufactured goods, by the then emerging United States. We were exporting our produce to them. We were exporting textiles and other manufactured goods. All the talk in Europe was of an American commercial invasion that was undercutting the fundamentals of the economy. And they had a big mortgage crisis and a credit bust. The United States by, by no means escaped the effects of that. We also had, beginning in 1873, a very severe recession. A bank crisis led to a stock market collapse. Lasted for four years in this country. It lasted for about seven or eight years in Europe. The effects were pretty dire on both sides of the Atlantic. But what happened during that period is that a number of very well capitalized American companies, private American companies, were less affected than some of their traditional competitors in Europe. Among them were Andrew Carnegie and John Rockefeller. And they snapped up a lot of their previous competitors, their smaller rivals around the country, created some of the big industrial conglomerates. And when we look back at the late 19th century now, we're not usually talking so much about the crisis of 1873. We tend to be talking about the Gilded Age, the period of uh, when the United States amassed uh, its first great wealth in comparison with the rest of the world. And I think one of the lessons from that crisis is that in a severe downturn, those that have the biggest cash reserves, money available to exploit the lower prices, the ability to make yourself more competitive in a downturn, are those that tend to rise the fastest when the downturn is over. And I bet I don't have to tell you these days which country has the biggest cash reserves. Overwhelmingly, the answer to that question is China. Whether China's biggest state-owned companies, like PetroChina or Baoshan Iron and Steel, or some of its big private entrepreneurs, will exploit the current opportunity as effectively as the American tycoons did 120 years ago, is something that we can't know for sure right now. But I do think that in comparison with a year or two ago, we're seeing some signs that China is well positioned to exploit this new opportunity. Ever since I've been involved with China, and that's been almost 20 years now, there's been a debate uh, among journalists and among scholars who pay attention to China about whether it's going to be able to emerge as a big global power, and if it does, what kind of power it's going to be, whether it's going to be a friend of the United States or potentially an enemy of the United States. And I don't think this crisis has done much to really resolve that debate. There's one school of people who think that many of the statistics that we're seeing about China's very rapid economic growth and its rising power are essentially fake. Uh, it's a government-controlled system. It's a fragile political system that depends on uh, one-party rule. There's not necessarily a strong base of support for the government in that country. Uh, we don't know what will happen within the ruling Communist Party, whether there will be a split among the elites there, whether there are different factions that will end up uh, undermining the party's collective power. Rising wealth in China has led to enormous inequality, big gaps in income between the urban areas and the rural areas. Uh, the party tends to keep itself in power by appeasing some of its own elites, allowing it to skim off profits. There's a lot of corruption in that society. So there's some skepticism
has been some skepticism that China has what it takes uh, to emerge. But in parallel with that, there's a second camp that is sort of labeled the China threat camp that says, sure, maybe all those problems exist, but secretly the party also has enormous reserves of strength. They're steadily building up their military capacity. There's a deep nationalist streak in China that that party can exploit, maybe at some point mobilize to become more of a force in the world, uh, that, the, that the ruling party is likely to seek legitimacy by projecting power abroad, using China's new economic clout to enhance its status in the world. This theory sort of has it that China is kind of a classic 19th century nation state, a country that's sort of gradually emerging into an international power because of its expanding commercial interests, its need to secure uh, supplies of commodities to keep its economy going. It has company investments overseas. It needs to be able to protect those, and it has national interests that could sooner or later lead it to have a conflict with the United States. As a journalist, I don't really subscribe to one school or the other. I think I belong more to a third camp that, that sort of uh, tries to take the best from both uh, schools of thought and, and, and kind of stand somewhere in the middle. Um, I think it's also possible that both could be wrong, and China could before too long emerge as something that we call a status quo power in the world neither a friend nor an enemy, but maybe sometimes a partner, sometimes a rival, a competitor, but not, uh, uh, but, but a competitor that buys into the basic international capitalist system that the United States is part of. I don't know that we're going to find an answer to that anytime soon. Uh, and moreover, I think that the, some of the information coming out of China during this crisis has actually made people who subscribe to one camp or the other more sure that their view of the future is correct. But I do think that there are a few indicators that we can talk about that are some of the reasons why I feel that whatever the, whatever the future holds, this crisis is likely accelerating that process in China. And one of them is a big question of global imbalances. And that's a kind of macroeconomic term that's very hard to write about in the New York Times because the copy editors will say, well, what does that mean? Um, but it's an important term. And essentially, I think you can describe it uh, as being an imbalance that exists primarily between the United States and China that have built up a mutual trade and financial interdependence like the world hasn't seen before. China, over the past decade and a half, has become the leading surplus producer of manufactured goods for export. And the United States in that same period has become overwhelmingly the leading surplus consumer of the world's extra exports. A decade or more of very fast export-led growth in China has given that country a foreign currency reserve of about $2 trillion. And China has taken north of $1 trillion of that and parked it in low-yielding American Treasury bonds, which it has long assumed to be the safest investment in the world. And essentially, all of that extra surplus capital that China has is a big factor behind the credit boom and the housing bubble that we had in this country uh, over the last several years. There's an a, a economist and historian named Niall Ferguson who came up with a clever term to describe the interdependence between the two countries. He called it Chimerica. If we were one country, we'd be in pretty good shape. But the truth is we're two separate countries and we're at very different stages of development. We have very different national identities. And I think the consensus is that the kind of imbalances that grew, that grew up between China and America are fundamentally unsustainable and we need to find a way to unwind them. 
how to unwind them and determining ultimately who got the worst end of this bargain is something that could probably take some time. I think you can't underestimate the challenge that China faces in trying to find a new way to develop its own economy. Since Deng Xiaoping launched China on the road to economic reform about 30 years ago, uh, they have followed a, an intensely export-driven model of development. Uh, they have not cultivated uh, the kind of broad middle class and consumer spending that many economists consider important if you develop a sustainable model of growth. They depend way too much on the international market, and so they've taken a very big hit in this crisis as well. Their exports are down 25 percent a month over the last several months. Um, but the challenge that China has is to create more of a consumer society, and the challenge that we have is to create more of a producing society. And let's face it, it probably is going to be easier to force a country to enjoy more of the fruits of its own labor than it is to persuade a country to start producing more of the fruits that it's taken for granted all these years. We have to become more of a saving nation. They have to become more of a spending nation. Which side would you rather be on? China is still in its early stage of growth. It has a fairly promising development horizon ahead of it. The United States is at a late stage of growth, has to readjust its model at a high level of development. There are some other advantages that China is likely to have in this situation. And one of them is probably something that you haven't thought of, but I think it's an interesting issue, and that is ideology. In this country, we often think of China as being communist China. Most of our media, much of our media, likes to refer to it that way. It wasn't that long ago we used to call it Red China. We assume that they're communists. We assume that communist governments govern by ideological control. The truth is that China has long since moved away from its ideological history. This country, on the other hand, is still working through a period of ideological struggle that is evident almost every day in our nation's press. We had in the 1980s an ideological revolution in the Reagan revolution, which kind of overthrew what was seen by many in the country as a statist approach to management. We embraced the market. We pushed for massive deregulation in many areas. We extolled the virtues of the market over the public sector. This continued very much intact through the Clinton years and the Bush years. And then after the end of the Cold War in the 1990s, we had the in intoxicating feeling of being the only superpower left in the world, no, me no meaningful rivals on the international scene, left to act more or less as we wanted to on the world stage. We're still working through the hangover of that. We have two wars, one in Iraq, another in Afghanistan. We have enormous defense budget, the largest level it's been at as a percent of, of GDP in this country since the Vietnam War. We have enormous diversion of resources from domestic investment in this country. And if you look at Obama traveling around the country these days trying to rally popular support for his budget initiatives, you might reflect on the fact that that's because a lot of people are calling him a socialist or calling his policies socialist. It's not yet clear that he has the political capital to get this through a Congress. It's not just Republicans, but also some Democrats who are wary of the state playing too large a role in our economy. This kind of debate no longer occurs in China. China had a period of intense ideological division in the, 19, in the 1960s going into the 70s. That period was known as the Cultural Revolution there. And it has since then largely disavowed ideology as any kind of a basis for making public policy. In the 1980s, China embraced pragmatic or pragmatism as the philosophy of the land. Uh, you may remember Deng Xiaoping's most famous expression, 
is called the black cat, white cat. Doesn't matter what color the cat is as long as it catches mice. That's as close as China comes to having a state ideology. If you can show me that something works, we'll do that. If you can't prove that it works, I don't want to hear the reasons why it might be a good idea anyway. That kind of flexibility can be very important in a crisis. If China wants to increase the state involvement in a ailing actor, uh, sector of the economy, there's no barrier to them doing that. If, on the other hand, they want to liberalize some sector to try to draw in investors and create a bigger market, there doesn't seem to be much of a barrier to them doing that either. They're in a post-ideological phase. So I think they may have a slight advantage in adjusting their development model in these stressful times. Another area where China may have an advantage is also something I think you may not have thought that much about, and that's the banking sector. For as long as I've been paying attention to China, and for a while I was a reporter for the Wall Street Journal there covering uh, the financial sector in the country, we Americans have thought of the Chinese banking system as being one of the most dysfunctional in the world. It's not dynamic. Uh, it's all state-owned. There's no private capital in China. There's no private lending. The state is involved in almost every lending decision in one way or another. Um, uh, China, for years, rejected American advice to privatize more of its banks, to get rid of the capital controls on its currency, to allow foreign banks to come in and compete on Chinese territory to get rid of the political influence that was distorting lending decisions and leading to bad loans in the Chinese system. But I think something that we may not have appreciated is that the ruling Communist Party in China was very reluctant to relinquish its control over the banking system because it had the philosophy that finance is a subordinate function in the Chinese system, or should be. It's kind of like a public utility. Banks were there to make sure that they could funnel money to more productive sectors of the economy, to industry, even to private entrepreneurs, to real estate and infrastructure development. They were not there to be, in and of themselves, a major en uh, engine of profit in the Chinese economy. That view is basically Marxist. They never completely graduated from that view. Finance is not for profit. Finance is to support what goes on in the rest of the economy. In the late 1990s, China had to go through a massive process of cleaning up its bank balance sheet. It spent one half of its GDP taking all these bad loans off the books, and everybody kind of tissed tissed and said, you guys don't know what you're doing, wasting all this money, you should just privatize these banks. Now they have a big advantage. Their banks are in quite good shape, while the rest of the banks around the world, especially those that are on a more private model, are in crisis. We have a crisis in our real economy and in our financial system. China at the moment has a crisis in its real economy, but it does not have a crisis in its financial system. So in January of this year alone, under government orders, Chinese banks lent more money than they did in the whole first quarter of 2008, and they're continuing that trend uh, in February and March. When they're in a crisis, they can order their banks to lend, and their balance sheets are pretty clean right now, another big advantage for China. Another one, another advantage uh, that I'll just mention quickly is, as I said at the beginning, the American press is often accused of putting out too much bad news. And in a crisis, that's a problem. There is a lot of bad news, but the more bad news that we print or put on the web, the more people are nervous about spending their savings, the more people don't want to shop, the more declines we have in GDP, and it's a, unfortunately something of a vicious circle. As you know, the Chinese media doesn't decide what tone and coverage to take on its own. It, it takes its orders from the Chinese propaganda department. And I spent a lot of years in China, and I still believe that one of the greatest dangers to stability in that society is the fact that its press is held captive by state control. You don't have to look too far back in Chinese history to see some of the major damage that that can cause. 
The media has at times refused to report on massive disasters in coal mines, epidemic diseases, shortages of food. Not having a free press can threaten your health. But in this one instance, a very serious, deep recession where the government needs people to start to restore confidence, having a captive press can be an advantage. Wen Jiabao, the Prime Minister of China, actually said it himself very clearly earlier this month. He said, confidence is more important than gold. In China, they have the advantage of being able to manufacture confidence. And if you read the press there these days, it's full of, uh, of upbeat stories about how the stimulus package in China has worked, a new engine of economic growth has kicked in, the China has developed a new development model, it's showing signs of success everywhere. We don't know for sure how true that is, but there is a sense that there's more optimism in that society now than in any other place in Asia affected by this crisis. And I think we have to acknowledge that in certain limited circumstances, having a press that takes its orders from the government can be a bit of an advantage. But I don't think all of this confidence uh, is just for show. China is also acting confident and trying to take advantage of some of these relative advantages. One of the leading ways that they're doing that these days uh, is going on a shopping spree overseas. In the last, in 2008, China had $50 billion in outgoing investment for almost 30 years. Uh, they have mainly been a recipient of foreign investment. But in the last couple of years, uh, they have become, and in this year in particular, a net exporter of capital. Uh, much of what they're doing is snapping up commodities, companies, sources of supply for their future economic growth overseas. They've made some bad deals, but in some areas there are some signs that they're using their money very wisely. They just reached a $25 billion 25-year agreement with uh, Russia's leading oil pro uh, provider, Rosneft, to provide China with a steady supply of crude oil over that period at the equivalent of $17 a barrel. So China's locked up a 25-year supply of oil at $17 a barrel. That's a big competitive advantage at a time when oil now is $54 a barrel and could well go a lot higher. They reached a similar deal with the big uh, petrochemical petro company in Brazil. Uh, they are currently negotiating to lock up some iron ore supplies in Australia. They've been on an undiminished buying spree in Africa in a lot of the leading commodity exporting nations. And over time, these investments could help solidify some of the cost advantages that China's enjoyed uh, over producers elsewhere in the world. I think we also see signs recently that China is trying to become more of a hard power in a military sense, particularly in its own region around the Indian Ocean. Uh, they've been spending heavily to develop port facilities, supply bases around the region. They've talked openly in the last couple of months about either building or acquiring an aircraft carrier for the first time. Defense spending in China is estimated now at about $60 billion a year, according to the official budget. According to the Pentagon, it's really about double that, which would make China the second largest spender on military after the United States. It's still a big gap, but it's closing. Uh, down in Thailand, China has talked about building a canal across a narrow part of the Thai Peninsula that would allow it to circumvent one of the most heavily patrolled straits in the world by the United States called the Malacca Strait, give them an alternative supply route in the event of a conflict. In a sense, China is kind of in its Panama Canal phase of development because of its needs to lock up supply routes around the world. It's actually thinking of digging a canal through another country's territory. We were in that position about 100 years ago. Sometime in this decade, China is actually going to have more naval warships on the waters than we do. They don't have anything like the firepower that the United States does. 
but quantity-wise, they're going to have a greater presence in the Pacific and the Indian Ocean. Um, I think there are also some signs that we're seeing China flex its muscle on the economic front. You may remember this summer uh, when the United States government made the decision to nationalize uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Some of the background of that is still coming out, but uh, many of our reporters have been focused on the events leading up to that decision, and it became pretty clear that the largest holder of debt of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac was the government of China. They held $400 billion in housing debt. And when the prospect of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac renegotiating some of its debt or even needing to go bankrupt became a possibility, China lobbied at a very high level to get the Bush administration to stand firmly behind Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. They exerted some of their economic clout then. Earlier this month, you may have read reports that the Prime Minister Wen Jiabao said that he was deeply concerned about the creditworthiness of the United States, made it clear that China may not extend loans to us indefinitely if it feels that the value of the dollar is being neglected. And just this week, China's central bank governor published a new paper proposing that the nations of the world get together to create a new reserve currency that would supplant the U.S. dollar as the preferred reserve currency around the world. Those are all kind of hints of rising Chinese confidence, could even say in some cases a little bit of bravado. Um, I think the truth is that on another day, maybe some other time if you invite me back, I can give you six or seven reasons why everything I just told you may not come to pass. There are a lot of good reasons to think that the Chinese model has as many challenges ahead as the American model. And if you spend a lot of time in China, I hope actually many of you will, you'll discover a lot of those weaknesses. They're very present and visceral when you're there. But when we're looking at the potential winners and losers in a crisis like this one, I think it'd be a mistake to ignore the possibility that we're in an 1870s kind of moment, a shift in global power that may take a while to play out, but that could well affect uh, power relations around the world in the next generation. So I'll end with that, and uh, I'd be happy to talk more about that, or particularly if anyone wants to argue, I like to argue. So <laughs> thanks. Raise your hand, tell us your name and what you're studying, and you can ask your question. Hi, uh, my name is Nathan Wirtz, and I'm an international relations major. Uh, I had a question um, in regards to the, the state of the United States socially in 1870 and up until uh, right around the, the Roosevelt administration. Um, there was a lot, because of all of the conglomerates being created, there was a lot of social inequality. Mm -hmm. And m more or less, we can say that the United States has overcome that gap over the course of the last century. Um, but, and obviously that is an, that was an important part in establishing a middle class, a consumer middle class. In your opinion, do you think that China will be able to overcome uh, the growing disparity um, in a way that will allow for more human rights and eventually create this middle class that can become more of a consumer. Do you think that China will be able to, to overcome that within the next few years? Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a good question because uh, a lot of China's growth um, uh, over the last couple of decades, as you, as you note, is somewhat similar to that period that we had um, in the late 19th century. There's really very rapidly growing inequality in China. The, the benefit, the fruits of uh, its new wealth are, are not spread evenly around the society. Uh, and the working class, in particular, the rural working class, uh, has done uh, not so well uh, during this era. I, I think that China recognizes the threat of inequality, partly because it's coming more toward capitalism from essentially a socialist tradition. So 
they are aware in a policy sense of the risks of too much inequality. After all, the Communist Party in China came to power through a revolution by mobilizing the peasantry against uh, uh, entrenched interests in the urban areas. And they're aware that that could happen to them if they allow this great inequality to continue to build up indefinitely. So they are trying to redistribute uh, some of the wealth. But I, but I think it's difficult, and I think one of the reasons it's difficult is that China has built its model on very low-priced uh, labor for export markets. And if your model is built on low-priced labor, they don't allow free unionization in that country. They don't give workers a lot of bargaining power. Uh, you're not really passing the fruits evenly down through the society, and you kind of exacerbate. So they, one of the challenges that they have going forward after this crisis is to really reinvent their model. The profits that they have do need to pass down into the consumer class, both in the cities and the countryside, create a little more uh, buying power and social stability. Uh, I think they're moving in that direction, but I think it's going to take a few years to see how successful they are. My name is Kirk Evans, and uh, I just got back from a year and a half in China where I read the China Daily every day, of course, which is always, always, always positive. Always upbeat, yeah. But uh, I really enjoy your articles in the uh, New York Times and also in the Wall Street Journal. I wonder if there's any kind of censorship going on for the foreign press. I feel like I get a much better view of what's going on in China through the articles in the New York Times. Um, well, China doesn't directly uh, censor anything that foreign journalists write while they're there. We're free to write whatever we can. What they do do is, you know, they monitor what we're doing, uh, who we're talking to, the people that we're trying to report on. Uh, we don't have secure email or cell phone communications there. So we're sort of restricted uh, not so much by law or by censorship, but by freedom of access to certain people in Chinese society. They can also bring a lot of people, a lot of pressure to bear on sources or on individuals who want to reveal information to us. Um, they don't act directly on us, but they act uh, on people around us. That said, I think that over the last decade or so, it's become a lot easier to be a foreign correspondent there. And I think you'll see both the Times and the Wall Street Journal, there are very few days that pass that we don't have an article on something going on there. And some days we have more than one business stories, social, political, whatever. Uh, we have now seven reporters in China. It's our largest. Uh, a largest single country in terms of the, the number of foreign correspondents that we have. It just passed Baghdad because we went down a little bit in Iraq and we went up in China. Um, it's a sign of the times, I think. So, you know, we take it very seriously and for the most part we are able to do our jobs there, but not without a little bit of harassment to the people we want to talk to. Yeah. Uh, my name is Micah. I'm a business major, and I just have a quick question about Chinese sovereign wealth funds. Um, their investments are suspect because if uh, their economy is doing so well, uh, why aren't they investing that money into their own economy? So my question for you is, are their investments from sovereign, sovereign wealth funds uh, purely risk management, or could there be ulterior motives? Uh, yeah, that's an important question, and um, you're right that they have a massive amount of dollars in their uh, uh, foreign reserves, some of which has been invested in sovereign wealth funds that are supposed to be invested abroad. Um, it's complicated financially a little bit because those dollar assets that China has are literally held in dollars, which if they wanted to spend them in China would have to be converted into Chinese currency. And when you convert dollars into Chinese currency, you create greater demand for the Chinese currency, and it pushes up the value of the Chinese renminbi. They've been eager to avoid pushing up the value of the Chinese renminbi because the higher its value grows against the dollar, the bigger challenge their exporters have keeping up exports at a time when 
they already face enormous challenges on the export front. So one of the reasons they're channeling so much of their wealth into these dollar-based funds is to try to artificially keep the value of the renminbi low so that they can keep their export model on track. But then they have the dilemma of what to do with all those dollars. And I described some of the ways that they're using them now, locking up long-term oil supplies and the like. But one of the ways that they're using is creating these sovereign wealth funds that are supposed to go around and snap up assets or find other ways. Uh, I don't think that that's been a very successful strategy, and I think that they're rethinking it a bit. And recently there's been some evidence that they are actually, despite the risk to the renminbi, uh, transferring some of those dollars back into renminbi and investing them domestically where they feel like they have a little bit more control over it because China lost many tens of billions of dollars on international markets during this crisis. And some of the people who are responsible for making those investments are paying a political price for that uh, at home. So it's changing as we speak, I think. Uh, my name is Ashley Hearn. I'm an international relations major. Um, in the context of the current economic crisis, do you have any policy recommendations for the U.S. and their interactions with China? Um, so far, I think the Obama administration uh, probably, given all those other problems that I mentioned at the, at the start, is not overly focused on, on the China uh, challenge, um, but it will need to be. And they need to work out some kind of arrangement to cooperate with China, both in fighting the international financial downturn uh, and in uh, particularly in climate change. I think that to the extent the U.S. is going to be able to achieve anything internationally in terms of limiting greenhouse gas emissions, there's no way that it's going to be able to make those steps without the cooperation of China. So I think both using collective resources to fight the downturn, both in their respective countries but also abroad, uh, refunding the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank to become more effective providers of uh, capital to countries that are hit hard in this crisis is another challenge that probably the U.S. And, the, and China need to work out together. And coming up with some kind of collective environmental strategy is probably another major challenge the two face. So they're going to have a lot to talk about. My name is David Bennett. I'm a math education major. Um, I want to, you mentioned about China's defense spending and, and uh, how large it was. I'm wondering why they're building up their defense and what their future military plans are. Um, good question and another very uh, difficult one to answer because I think uh, there are probably a few dozen people at the Pentagon who are asking them that questions all the time and we don't really know what their intentions are. Um, you know, uh, I think that they have for years been primarily focused in on defending what they consider to be their own national territory. Uh, and parts of their national territory are still disputed, um, uh, particularly Taiwan. Uh, and the, the future status of Taiwan is, is something approaching an obsession for the Chinese military. Uh, for many years, it was assumed that the United States, uh, in the event of a conflict in Taiwan, could, if it chose, intervene on Taiwan's side and make it very difficult for China to reclaim Taiwan by force. Um, but I think those assumptions are now questionable. China probably has the capacity, both in terms of its naval power and uh, its air power, to uh, defend uh, uh, its interests in Taiwan, at a minimum extracting an extremely and probably unacceptably high price from the United States for getting involved in a conflict there. So arguably, They've achieved one of their objectives. It's an extremely expensive effort on their part just to be able to militarily defend their claim to Taiwan because it's not a high strategic priority for the United States to try to take Taiwan away from it. Uh, but I do think that the bulk of their spending has been geared around ensuring their right to intervene in Taiwan if they seek fit. 
and denying the U.S. the right to, to uh, interfere at will in the Pacific region that China considers, you know, its home territory. But I think secondarily, as I said, they're building up a lot of presence in the Indian Ocean. They consider a crucial commercial natural resources supply route uh, and also a strategic area of interest and, 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 and to a certain extent they're becoming a, a, a traditional great power and wanting to be able to project power out uh, and defend their commercial interests wherever they, they are. I don't think that they have some kind of nefarious, you know, military aim of invading the United States. They're, I've seen very few signs that the Chinese military is a crazy, independent, rogue institution uh, that, that you know, they're cooperating quite a bit with the U.S. and cracking down on terrorism, for example. They are, in many senses, a status quo power. They're defending their own interests. They're not looking to pick a fight. But when any power is building up military might as quickly as they are, obviously the Pentagon needs to be concerned about that. My name is Dallin Shainer. I'm also an international relations major. Um, given China's emergence and its military build, especially, how are Japan and South Korea responding to that, and how are the relations between those three countries? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, well, um, as you may know from asking the question, that the Japan has a very wary and skeptical view about uh, China, and, and the reasons for that are that uh, uh, you know, China and Japan were on opposite sides of World War II, um, and, and Japan inflicted a great deal of uh, damage in China during that conflict, and many Chinese do, in fact, uh, hate Japan, and it's probably the leading nationalist cause in the, in the country. There's strong popular support. Uh, for taking tough measures against Japan, not necessarily military measures, but up to and including military measures. And on the Japanese side, there's a tremendous wariness about China's economic rise, what it means for Japan's econo economic health. So that rivalry is much more intense than the rivalry between China and the United States. And one of the challenges for the U.S. in Asia is to manage relations between Japan and China because I don't think the United States sees it in its interest for these two to build up a rivalry that, that becomes uh, military in nature. We don't want Japan to have to remilitarize in a significant way. Um, but if you push it down to a popular level, uh, feelings about China in Japan are very negative and feelings about Japan in China are very negative. The leadership of both countries tends to be wanting to tamp down that sentiment, not let it get out of control. So at the moment, it's in control, but if there were some kind of major incident or a big accident or some kind of misunderstanding, it's possible that that could be a flashpoint in Asia. I'm Morgan Wills, also an international relations major, and I see a lot of similarities between Russia and China in terms of wealth disparity and ideology. But Russia seems to be suffering a lot more from the global economic crisis. And I was wondering, what do you see Russia's role being in the future in terms of China? Yeah. Um, uh, Russia's situation is, a, is an intriguing one now. I think uh, up until about a year ago, before the full extent of this crisis uh, started to become clear, uh, a lot of people were kind of lumping Russia and China together as the new future threats. Russia, of course, was also a past threat. but kind of restoring some of its great power status. Uh, only in August, Russia uh, engaged in a short war with its neighbor, Georgia. Um, Russia, I think, is a much more militaristic country than, than China is. Um, however, the foundations of Russia's revival are a lot shakier than, than China's recent growth. Russia amassed uh, its wealth in the last decade or so basically through oil prices uh, and also other commodity prices. It's a huge commodity exporter. And at the moment, commodity prices are at relatively very low levels, and that's put a lot of strain on uh, Putin's uh, control over, uh, over, over Russia politically. Uh, he used that oil wealth to extend his influence domestically and to a certain extent abroad. It's dried up. Of course, it could come back again. 
Uh, if, the, if the world economy revives, the price of oil will probably go up and Russia will be in better shape. But I think the fact that it's so commodity dependent and doesn't have a broad-based diverse economy makes it less of a long-term competitor uh, in the global landscape in comparison with China, which I think is really has a broad base of both state-driven but also private-driven investment and growth, much more sustainable model, and also probably less of a uh, tradition of playing a big foot on the world stage as Russia. So uh, China is in some ways maybe a little bit less of a concern in terms of a military threat, but a greater concern in terms of its economic power. 